So today we're going to talk about the great novel The Bell Jar by the American writer Sylvia Plath. And if you appreciate my reviews and would like to show your support, please give this review a like and subscribe to my channel. That way this video will get to more people who might also enjoy it. Thanks. Okay, so let's talk about The Bell Jar, which was first published in 1963, signed by Victoria Lucas, which was a pseudonym Sylvia Plath hid behind because her novel was semi-autobiographical. And because Sylvia Plath poured some of her life into her only work of prose fiction, I think I should talk about her before getting into the novel. So Sylvia Plath is better known as a poet. Critics call her poetry confessional. I read her poetry collections in college and they made a big impact on me. I think most people who read her poetry are impacted by it one way or another. Okay, so Sylvia Plath was born in 1932 and took her own life after making some failed attempts in 1963, which was very shortly after the publication of her only novel, The Bell Jar. Sylvia Plath was born and grew up in Massachusetts. Her father, Otto Plath, was a German scientist who died when Sylvia was only eight years old. Her mother, Aurelia, was an American of Austrian descent. After her father's death, Sylvia, her younger brother, and their mother moved into the maternal grandmother home in Boston. Sylvia Plath was an excellent student and, as a young woman, attended Smith College majoring in English. She then went on to win a Fulbright scholarship to study at Cambridge University in England. There, she met the English poet Ted Hughes, who would later become her husband. The couple lived mostly in England, but their marriage wasn't a happy one, to say the least. Uh, Sylvia Plath struggled with depression and, as I said, attempted suicide several times. She killed herself shortly after the publication of The Bell Jar in London. She used a pseudonym to protect her family because the novel is uh, autobiographical, or at least semi-autobiographical. So in this novel, she fictionalizes events in her own life from the summer and fall after her junior year in college, when she lived in New York City and worked as a guest editor in a magazine. So The Bell Jar was first published under the writer's real name in 66, and it only hit American bookstores in 71. So we are dealing here with a book that was very painful to the writer's family. We know that her mother, Aurelia, for example, did not want the novel to be published in the US and she fought against it. The Bell Jar is what critics call a roman à clé or a novel with a key. What that means is that the characters in the novel are all based on real people. Readers can work out who those real people are, which explains why Sylvia Plath's family was not so keen on seeing the book published. The novel is narrated by its protagonist, a college girl named Esther Greenwood, who is based on young Sylvia Plath. Esther, in the novel, struggles with her mental health to the point of trying to kill herself. The Bell Jar chronicles how she first developed symptoms, the different psychiatric treatments she was subjected to, and several of her suicide attempts. I don't think I'm spoiling anything here, and I firmly believe that people should know all of this before reading the novel. I think it is important to know because some people might be triggered by some of the material in the novel, and I think it's only fair that they know that before deciding whether the book is for them or not. I think The Bell Jar is a great novel, well worth reading. It is a coming-of-age story like no other I have ever read. It ain't no Jane Eyre, for sure. The Bell Jar, I think, must be one of the most original, less conventional coming-of-age stories I have ever read. I would say that Esther, Esther Greenwood, is a girl at the beginning of the novel and becomes a woman by the end of the novel. The Bell Jar deals with that liminal space between being a teenager and being an adult. The Bell Jar is also the portrait of a bright, intelligent person corseted by a morally hypocritical society. We see that hypocrisy in many of the characters, like, for example, Esther's college boyfriend, Buddy. Esther must face all these arbitrary conventions of what being a woman should mean that existed in the 1950s, and despite all the advances brought on by feminism, I think it is obvious that we still have a long way to go. How can Esther fulfill her ambitions in a world that offers women such a narrow range of roles? There is also a criticism to psychiatry in the novel, such as it was practiced back in the 1950s, at least by some doctors. Esther uh, 
has a lot of treatments. Some of them work better than others. So I don't think, at least from reading this novel, that Sylvia Plath was totally anti-psychiatry. And well, I think that is all I can say about The Bell Jar without spoiling it for people who have not read it yet. If you want to read The Bell Jar, I always link to the books I review in the description box for each video. So you can buy your own copy of The Bell Jar at no extra cost and support my channel. Now I'm going to summarize the plot and talk about The Bell Jar in more detail and there will be some spoilers. So you have been warned. If you don't want to hear any spoilers about The Bell Jar, you should stop watching right about now. And I will see you again, I hope, for another video. Okay, for those of you who are still here, I am now going to summarize the plot and share more thoughts I had on The Bell Jar. The novel opens with Esther Greenwood, a young woman from Massachusetts, going to New York City. Esther is a brilliant college student who has a summer job as a guest editor in a magazine. Her demanding boss is a woman named JC. As a young single woman, Esther lives in a women's hotel together with other female college students, 12 of them in total. Life in New York is exciting, but Esther is just not feeling it. For one thing, she's worried about the execution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were convicted of spying for the Soviet Union. This was a controversial uh, real-life affair in the early 1950s in America. The Rosenbergs were executed in June of 1953. However, Esther and her friends have a busy social life, courtesy of their sponsors who take them out for dinner very often. And in one of those dinners, Esther gets food poisoning. And then, after that, she tries to lose her virginity in vain. Esther has a lot of doubts about her future, and that weighs down on her. At the end of her stay in New York, on her very last night, she suffers a rape attempt by a man named Marco, who had taken her out on a date. Esther is a bright, ambitious young woman, but this is 1950s America, so she wonders what she should do. Should she follow the conventional path of getting married and be someone else's housewife, or should she use her intelligence and fulfill her ambitions? Esther has a suitor, Buddy Willard, who has a TB but wants to marry her as soon as he's uh, recuperated. Esther wants to write poetry, which is something that Buddy does not understand, and that is not his only defect. Buddy then confesses that he had sex with someone else while they were dating, and that confession prompts Esther to decide that she cannot marry Buddy. And she also decides that she needs to lose her virginity as soon as possible. Now back in Boston, Esther is forced to spend the rest of the summer with her mother because she has not been accepted to a writing class that she had applied to before the summer. But Esther has a lot of plans. She wants to write a novel, she wants to learn new skills, but soon she starts developing some worrying symptoms that something is not quite right with her. She becomes an insomniac, uh, she cannot focus on her reading and writing anymore, and she stops washing herself. Understandably, her mother is also worried about this, so she takes her to a psychiatrist who prescribes something horrific called electric shock therapy. As you can imagine, this kind of treatment actually makes Esther feel a lot worse, and this enchains a series of suicide attempts. Um, Esther tries to slit her wrists, hang herself, uh, drown herself, and she finally takes a lot of sleeping pills. However, that last attempt is also not successful, so Esther wakes up in a hospital. Physically, she's fine, but she's sent to a psychiatric ward. Um, she hasn't changed her mind about committing suicide, which is the reason why they want to keep her there. She's still determined to end her own life. But things become a bit better when a famous novelist named Philomena Guinea, who pays Esther's scholarship, agrees to also pay for Esther to be moved to a private hospital. Esther's new psychiatrist, Dr. Nolan, a woman Esther feels she can trust. While in that hospital, Esther becomes friends with another patient, a woman named Joan, but their relationship sours when Joan tries to seduce her. Esther makes steady progress, so she's allowed to go out every so often, and she finally manages to lose her virginity in one of her forays. But that event also has her bleed so badly that she has to go to the ER. Anyway, one day Joan hangs herself, then Buddy visits Esther in the hospital and they put an official end to their relationship, finally. Esther is due to leave the hospital and go back to college that very winter. 
The novel ends with Esther walking into a meeting room where she's due to have her leaving interview with a group of doctors. And even though Esther feels sane and Dr. Nolan has reassured her, she knows that the bell jar of madness will descend on her again at some point in the future. So the novel has a bittersweet ending that becomes only bitter when you know what actually happened to the real Esther Greenwood. Knowing that Sylvia Plath continued to struggle with depression for the rest of her short life made even more suicidal attempts until she finally succeeded at killing herself. I think that colors our experience of reading this novel. And it is impossible to shut this novel when we're done with hopefulness, knowing what actually happened. And I imagine that most people who read The Bell Jar already know what happened going in. And as I said earlier, I think it is important to know that. I had read a lot of um, Sylvia Plath's poetry before I first The Bell Jar. I actually resisted reading the novel for years because I thought it would be too hard for me, even though thankfully, I have not had any experiences that are similar to what Plath narrates in her novel and what she went through. What finally attracted me to this novel was its feminist aspect, which I wouldn't say is super explicit. I think you need to read a little bit uh, between the lines, but I think that The Bell Jar is a great novel. I really enjoyed uh, Platt's portrayal of the boozy, violent New York of the 1950s, which probably contrasted a lot with the then up-and-coming uh, suburban life uh, that Sylvia Plath slash Esther Greenwood would have been used to. And it is not as glamorous and sophisticated as she imagined it to be either. Now, The Bell Jar is not an easy read, but I think it is a fascinating novel. 